Hello and welcome to the Blitz Business Development Show. My name is Mayo Best and I'm a business consultant and coach as well as the founder of the Blitz Business Development Academy. This is the show that provides guidance, resources, and access to best practices to help you advertise, manage, and build geometric profits. From freelancers and home-based business owners to startups and storefronts, you will learn how to start small as you think and grow big. Hello, folks, and welcome to the Bliss Business Development Show. I am your host, Mayo Best, and today we're going to dive into the topic of how and why to write your first book. Now, I know previously during the season, we actually had this topic up, but it was from a different sort of angle, and we really discussed more about becoming a bestseller, and that was when we did the show with Miss Divya Perrick earlier in the season, but this time I wanted to revisit this again because I know how powerful it is to write a book and establish yourself in the marketplace by doing so. So I have another guest today, and what we're going to actually do is approach this from more of a novice, more of a beginner's perspective, and we're going to dive even deeper, not just into how and why, but she's going to give us a bunch of gems on process. And if you listen to the show, folks, grab your pen and paper. This is going to be great. But listen, this guest, this person, the person that we're about to introduce you to here, folks, she is phenomenal at what she does when it comes to writing books and her process is second to none. Okay. And not only that, you're going to be working with someone who really understands both the corporate and the entrepreneurial side of your mindset in terms of how to write a book and extract what you need to get out of that process to make it successful. So let's buckle up and let's dive in. Linda Griffin is a published author, keynote speaker, and writing and self-publishing coach who teaches coaches, consultants, and other professionals how to capture their wisdom in a book, making it accessible to more people who can benefit from it. In the process, her clients increase their authority and thought leadership position in their chosen markets. Linda developed the author fast track program based on her experiences in writing and publishing a book. She takes people from idea to book in hand in as few as 90 days days all right folks as i pretty much have promised we have an extraordinary writer with us today writer author speaker extraordinaire and she is going to bless us folks with a ton of gems as you know i like to say so without further ado you know what you're supposed to do at this time if you've got that pen and if you got that paper grab your bag so we can catch these gems she is going to share with us a lot of wisdom and a lot of her expertise now i'm gonna tell you guys right now if you are looking to take your business to the next level all right what she's about to talk about you absolutely want to do now i will be honest it is something that i'm working on myself but i do know the power of it and that's why she's on the show today Okay, so folks, without further ado, we have Miss Linda Griffin with us. And Linda, how are you doing, ma'am? Hi, Mayo. I'm doing wonderfully, and thank you so much for having me on the show today. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, we're going to dive right into it. We have okay. a lot to cover. So let's start with this. Where are you originally from? Okay, I am originally from uh, Alabama. Uh, home okay. of Auburn University Tigers, and uh, graduated from from there. And uh, and then uh, right after that, right after I graduated, I, uh, I I was hired by IBM, and so I moved uh, to the DC metro area. Okay. And uh, as part of my corporate career, I moved around a lot. You know, IBM used to mean I've been moved, <laughs> and I okay. was. So I, okay. I've moved all up and down the uh, the East Coast. And, okay. I, and then, surprisingly enough, settled back into the D.C. metro area, which is where I am now. Okay. Well, you, you said the D.C. metro area. For those of us that are from this area, we want you to properly represent where you are from. <laughs> where exactly? Okay. I am, in, I am in Northern Virginia. Okay. Specifically Ashburn, very close to Dulles Airport. If any of your fans uh, travel to the D.C. area, I'm mm -hmm. quite near the airport. Okay. All right. VA. That'll work. That'll work. <laughs> okay. So let me ask you this though, because that's quite an interesting transition. You, you moved from Alabama 
to mm-hmm. here. My father's originally from North Carolina. So he's mm-hmm. from the country as well. And it was an interesting, I think, transition for him coming mm-hmm. to a major city and metropolis like this. What was it like for you? Yeah, it was quite an experience and, and more so from a culture standpoint, because, uh, you know, in the South, you don't really start talking business immediately. You mm. talk about the weather, mm. you talk about the family, you ask how people are doing. And when I moved to this area and took a phone call, it was immediately jumping into, OK, what was the business of the day? <laughs> right. Mm. And so that was a, a big culture shock for me, having come from an area where you that was very uh, impolite to do that. Mm. So, okay, can you talk a little bit more about Alabama, though? I'd like to hear more about that. What was it like growing up in Alabama? Well, you know, it was it was quite interesting because, uh, you know, I grew up in the, you know, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, and it was still, um, you know, the South was still not 100% integrated. Uh, you know, I went to a an all-black elementary school and all-black high school. Mm. And uh, so I was had quite an insulated childhood. Mm-hmm. And um, when I went to college, to a major university, even though it was only about an hour's drive away, it was a world away, right? Because it was uh, a predominantly white institution. At the time, they had about I don't know, like 25,000 students and 200 of us were black. <laughs> and so, wow. so it was, uh, you know, it was quite an interesting experience to be in a huge auditorium, let's say in my freshman classes, be the only black person in the room. And when the instructor called the role and mm. called my name, he looked directly at me. Now, how would you know in a class of 200 that right. that was me, right? right? So, yeah. But I, but I actually had a lot of fun uh, at the university. Even though it was a small community, we were all very close knit. And uh, and so we had a lot of I had a lot of fun and and uh, it was a great experience for me. Did you have brothers and sisters? I do, I do. Yeah, in fact, I'm the oldest of four. Okay. And uh, people always ask about my leadership experience, and I said, "Well, I've been a leader all my life because I'm the oldest of four kids, so I boss them around their entire childhood." <laughs> right. <laughs> and that was good training for me when I became in a leadership position. <laughs> mm, interesting. Okay. So, what do you think, if anything, uh, about your childhood? that actually influences the work that you do now? You know, it's uh, it's so interesting because um, even though I have a business now, a small business, when I grew up, the idea of being successful was to get a good corporate job. You know, Mm -hmm. my parents, my mother was a school teacher Mm -hmm. and my father was a mailman. Mm-hmm. And um, and so the people and the other people that I saw around me, parents of my friends, they all work for someone else. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that was really my experience of, OK, you need to work for someone else and get a good position so that you can be successful. Mm-hmm. And it actually, even though I worked for a large corporation, my entrepreneurial spirit, if you will, came about working in that large corporation because it ended up that I was assigned to a project that was brand new to the company. And we had to put together a very small team of people that would have all of the aspects from sales and marketing all the way to the implementation of the product Mm. within a self-contained group. And so it was like learning how to run an entrepreneurial small business, even though it was housed within a big corporation. We had our own budget. We had our own mm. staff. Uh, we had our own ROI that we had to meet, you know, within the corporation. And so, uh, so as I was working on that and starting to think about what did I want to do after I ended my corporate career, I really started thinking about, well, you know, maybe I want to dip my toe in and start my own business. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's a that's a journey in itself because. Again, without having that experience of seeing a lot of people who owned their own businesses, I had no idea what was what it entailed, even though I had a master's degree, but I just still mm. didn't really know realistically what it entailed. Mm. And 
being used to being in the corporate environment where you have a huge support system, where you have, uh, you know, secretaries and you have IT people and you have all these other people that are support to you and then starting your own business where you wear all of the hats, right? Uh, I, I, I did some work with the, our local chamber and that was one of the slides that I showed was somebody that had, you know, like 10 hats on their head because I said, you are the salesperson, you are the delivery person, you are the the uh, the secretary, the admin, you are the, you know, you are all of those things as a small yes, business. You are. <laughs> Um, and then the other part was, which was a big shock to me from a, from a standpoint of being in corporate and being in a fortune 500 company, whenever I would visit a potential client, mm -hmm. I had automatic credibility, right? Because I had that mm -hmm. corporate name on my business card. Right. And when I opened my own business and I would put my business card on the table, they would go, well, who are you and what business is that? Right. right. <laughs> so that instant credibility just wasn't there. And I had to learn how to establish that credibility um, with my clients. That's interesting. It's, it's all for those that don't know, for some of maybe the younger <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, audience mm -hmm. members, you know, IBM was a huge company. You don't right. hear about IBM as much today, even though right. they are still around. Right. You hear about the Google stuff, but I, before yes. Google, even before Microsoft, mm -hmm. IBM was huge. Right. So right. That's interesting. So, and a lot, and the reason why I say this is interesting is because not a lot of folks are able to always switch from the corporate right. you know right. mindset to the entrepreneurial mindset right. which is right. two totally different things absolutely um, so it, it, that honestly is interesting cuz now do you think that that had more to do with the fact that even before you started in the corporate you know in in, in corporate work that you already had more of an entrepreneurial mindset before you got there based off of your upbringing what you were exposed well, to yeah, I, you know, based on my upbringing, and here's the thing, I I looked at my corporate career differently than a lot of people do. Mm. A lot of people feel like they are, that they don't have any power as an employee, right? That mm. you're at the mercy of your employer and you have to do whatever it is that say you do. And yes, that is true to a certain degree. But mm. I always looked at myself almost as a corporation of one, right? I am Linda Griffin, corporation of Linda Griffin. And I have a set of skills that I bring to the table. Mm. And because I bring that to the table, this corporation is paying me for those skills, right? Mm. So I was always of the mindset that, number one, my resume was always updated with my latest information because I never knew at what point I might have to switch and go somewhere else, right? right. I always also looked for assignments that had meet to them that were not just fluff assignments that i had mm. clear-cut responsibilities where i had ownership of some piece of it even if it was a small piece of it because mm. i knew that i had to continually show my value to my company every day you right. know i i never was one who thought well okay the company owes me you know a job they really don't there it's an exchange of services exchange of services mm. for money and so yeah so i i did have that mindset and know mm. that i was let's say in control of my own destiny to to a great degree okay so you know for some of y'all that didn't honestly catch that <laughs> what she just showed you was that's a value centric mindset that she has or had even as an employee Mm -hmm. Which honestly, if you have a value centric mindset like that, which will make you a go getter, mm -hmm. okay, it will make you uh, someone who's already going to be accountable, mm -hmm. all right, and it will make you somebody that's not just accountable but responsible and right. understand why you why you have value in the marketplace as right. opposed to some of the things that I see today where people just want what they want but not right. necessarily because they're bringing more value to the table, right. That, now I get why your transition mm -hmm. wasn't that difficult to make because mm -hmm. people don't really realize that that's exactly what you must have to be right. even even in the runnings of being successful as an entrepreneur. Right. That's have right. To have those qualities. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now yeah, it makes absolutely. sense. <laughs> 
right, right. Now, now it makes sense. Okay, so let me ask you this: um, At what point do you think that you knew that you wanted to pursue your line of work that you are now? Well, I'll tell you, it came about very in a very long and winding road, right? Because mm-hmm. when I when I first opened my business, I was looking at what were the skills, that whole value proposition, right? What mm-hmm. were the skills that I brought to the table? And one of the things that I brought to the table was being very successful as a female and a minority in a male dominated company, right? right? And I felt like, okay, I could help other people with that, other females in corporations. And so I became a coach, a business coach mm-hmm. for uh, females in business. Mm-hmm. And even though I liked that and it was great fun, it, it, there was something missing for me. I, I just felt like that wasn't really the calling. Mm-hmm. And uh, around that time, I was also networking with other business owners. And I had learned a lot from, about processes when I worked for in corporate. And I thought, okay, well, maybe this is an area for me where I can help small businesses tailor processes to their environment as opposed to a bit what a big corporation would do. Again, with that limited staff, but you can still put processes in place. Right. And I did that for a while. And that was great because I was helping small businesses but the problem with that was that I had to learn a new language every time I got a new client so it would be office products one week and it would be accounting the next week and Uh you know and I was like oh no this isn't really it either (laughs) and around that time my friends would laugh at me because they would say okay Linda what business are you in today because every time I talk to you you're in a different business and and you know that's one of the lessons that I learned is that you don't have, always have to get it spot on day one, right? I mean, I tried out a lot of different methodologies and a lot of different areas mm-hmm. before I ended up where I am now. Right. And, and actually where I ended up now is a result of that journey. Because when I, about the time that I said, okay, I've got to stop going to different types of businesses every week, I decided <laughs> I wanted to specialize, right? Yes. And uh, I love to travel. Travel is one of my hobbies. And I decided I would focus on the travel and hospitality industry. Mm-hmm. And I would pick a niche in the travel and hospitality industry because it's huge, right? Right. And right. so I would pick a niche and I'd pick the bed and breakfast industry. Okay. And um, and the, the problem was that I didn't have any clients in that industry at the time, and so I didn't have any credibility. It goes back to this whole credibility piece. Yep. <laughs> and my my business coach at the time said, "Well, you know, the best way to establish credibility is with a book. So why don't you write a book for the mm. bed and breakfast industry?" And that became my first book. Now that journey of writing that book was interesting because. I decided I wanted to launch that book at the big industry conference for all bed and breakfast, right? Which happened mm. once a year in January. Okay. Well, it was October of the previous year when I decided I was going to do this. So I literally <laughs> had about 90 days <laughs> to get a book written and published. Right. And okay. I really had no clue what I was embarking upon. Right? right. I didn't know anything about the publishing industry. I, I knew enough to know that I could not get a traditional publishing contract. I knew it would take too long to do that. So I knew I had to self-publish mm-hmm. and I ended up just immersing myself into the self-publishing world, you know, having stops and starts and, you know, that kind of a thing. And um, eventually I did get it. I got that. I, I, I joke and I say the ink was wet on the books, <laughs> but <laughs> But I I launched that book at that conference, the book is called Maximum wow. Occupancy. And that book opened doors for me because I had a marketing plan going into that conference where I was going to give away a certain number of books to key mm-hmm. people. And, um, and that book ended up helping me to become an authority immediately in that bed and breakfast industry. Mm. You've disrupted my my process because you we've got to go back for just a second before we go forward sure to something i think is so key 
for people that are struggling because I have, to, I have to admit I've gone through all of the stuff you've mentioned mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. one of the most annoying things and I'm going to say this for those folks out there who've got family members that may be listening mm -hmm. to people that are actually trying to do this the mm -hmm. most annoying thing you can keep telling an entrepreneur is what business are you in now <laughs> yes right uh, right, guys, right, it used right. To really <laughs> upset me because the yes. thing is is you knew that you're that you're on in a process mm -hmm. of like weeding things out and figuring yes. out what works and what doesn't yeah but through the outside looking in people yeah. are not going to understand that process unless right. they're already on the same journey that's correct that's correct and so this this is just to you all out there that are struggling with that <laughs> if that's where you are she is so right it takes time to really, I mean, I'm, I'm 45 and honestly, I can't say how much things are full circle, but it's like when they come back around again and you're a little bit more refined and seasoned and have even more skills, even mm -hmm. the things that you did 20 years ago, when you go to do them again, it's just so much easier. Yes. You're so much better and you just get really comfortable. Yes. And right. so don't, don't fret, don't quit. <laughs> yes. Don't quit. Don't quit. <laughs> That's right. Hey, it, it, is guys. A it is a journey. And and the first thing you do may not be successful. That's the other thing is yes. that we, and especially in America, we tend yeah. to think that if it's not successful right off the bat, then just abandon it and move on. And, right. and that's not really true. It, it, you're going to have some stops and starts. You're going to take a couple of steps back, you know, when you take a step forward, but just keep plugging through. And yep. as long as you're learning from those backtrack steps, it's right. still all good. Right. And you know what What I say about this, too, is one of the, the, the smartest things you can do is that you have to learn how to uh, reframe your entire definition, in most cases, of mm -hmm. what failure actually is. Right. Because right. as soon as you start reframing your, your concept and your methodology around what failure is. Right. You honestly can't do anything but succeed. Right. Right. But that's a process and that does take time. But again, you will learn it, guys, as long as you don't quit. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. Don't look at it as a failure. Look at it as you tried it. It didn't work. What did I learn from it? Right. And 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 take what you learned from it and apply that to the next try. That's right. That's right. And if you can jump to this and I'm going to move on after this, but if guys, if you can jump to as soon as something doesn't work out, fine, you're human. You're going to might probably have an emotional response. Mm -hmm. But the question you want to train yourself to ask, okay, all right, what did I learn about how, what not to do that I can mm -hmm. use to help me figure out how to make it work? Because essentially, that's what just happened. You just learned what doesn't work. So you can right. take that off your list and now try something else. Okay? All right. right. Now we can move right. on. Yeah. <laughs> We have to have those gym <laughs> moments every now and then. Yes, yes. Okay, so my next question for you is this. Um, your background. Now, you, you said you went to school. You, did you go to school for business and you got a master's in business? Or uh, Well, yes, I got a master's in business, but I went to school for, I, I was a mathematics major. Oh, um, okay. I, I, yes, I was a mathematics major. And I like to say that I use my left brain for most of my life, right? Because of a okay. math major, I joined IBM uh, right out of college and I was in the computer science field, technology field. And so it was very left brain oriented. And right. I, I did try to bring the right brain in because I did get an MBA while I was working. Mm -hmm. And so I brought some of that business savvy into it. But it wasn't until I started doing what I'm doing now, working mm. with authors that I said, I really bring my right brain into it now, that creative side mm. has now come into play. So, I, so for me, it's really a good balance mm -hmm. because I bring a left brain mentality to a creative field, right? Mm. And so what I do is bring process and step-by-step, step-by-step uh, step -step thinking to something that traditionally you just kind of go by the seat of your pants and wing it. Mm, so I like that. So that means it's for your, your formulaic and approach. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. That's right. Awesome. That's awesome. 
Okay. So are there any other other things that you've studied um, that you would say that possibly helps you do what you're doing at this, you know, in addition to whatever you learn in, in college and in school? Are there any other types of skill sets that you've developed to help you? In what yeah, you yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big mystery reader. I, I like to read mysteries for fun. <laughs> and one of the things that you do in a mystery story is you try to figure out who did it. And, and how they did it and what happened. So the, the author is giving you clues as you go along. And, and that's one of the things that has helped me in my business life because mm-hmm. I'm always trying to figure out, well, what was the meaning behind that? What, what caused this to happen? Mm-hmm. And if we need to fix something, what is really the problem as opposed mm-hmm. to what's on the surface? Like what's the deeper problem that we need to solve? And so that has really served me well because, you know, when people talk to me about what their goals are and what they want to do, I can start asking those deeper questions, like going one level deeper, two level deeper to say, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. what is it that you really want to get out of, let's say in my case, writing a book, right? What do you really want it to do for you? Okay. Okay. So you're using soft skills, critical thinking mm-hmm. skills, problem mm-hmm. solving. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm saying it like that because these are things that I'm always telling the audience about. Yes. Uh, yes. They, they're skills that I think we don't talk about enough, you know, right. in society, especially right now, there's so right. much of an emphasis on, you know, a lot of the technical skills and learning how to code mm-hmm. and program. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I honestly think that we're a lot more so in a deficit of these soft skills. Right. And right. these soft skills, I think, are kind of getting lost on some folks. Right. And I'm, the reason why I'm pointing this out, because I want people to understand these are the elements that's making you successful. Right. And, and the other thing I would say is curiosity. That has mm. served me really well. Being mm. curious both about what the issues are as well as about with my clients. You know, um, Mm -hmm. a lot of times when, and it doesn't matter what business you're in, but your clients are coming to you to help them solve something, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they won't be able to articulate exactly what it is you know, they'll have like a surface answer when you try to say, well, you know, you can try to figure out whether your products and services will help them or not. Mm -hmm. But by being curious, taking a step back, not just jumping into here's what my products and services do for you. Here's their benefits and all of this. But being curious about, well, what really is bugging this person? What is keeping them up at night? And can my products and services help alleviate any portion of that, right? Mm -hmm. And what I found is that by being curious and and asking questions, sometimes it's a good fit and sometimes it isn't. And that's okay, because sometimes I can refer them to someone else that can help their problem. And that's a good thing for me as well, because I'm networking with other business owners who do something different than what I do. And so I can give a referral or I can pull someone in to partner with them to help them solve this client's problem. So yeah, so curiosity and being able to ask questions and really listening to the answers as opposed to waiting just to give your spiel that right. I say has served me well. Okay, so I'm going to do something with you that I didn't plan mm-hmm. on doing, to be honest. Okay. okay. But you're so sharp that I think you'll be fine with this. <laughs> Let's say, because I want to give the guests uh, uh, just a little bit of an idea, you know, mm-hmm. for people that are trying to make their way to this decision about um, writing a book. Let's just mm-hmm. say, hypothetically speaking, you have mm-hmm. a realtor. OK, mm-hmm. realtor comes to you and says, I want to write a book about real estate. Mm-hmm. But I have no idea where to start and I want to stand out. Right. OK. Right. Can you just give us a little bit of an idea as to what your methodology of approach might be to deal with someone like that on that type of sure. situation? Sure. Sure. Uh, well, the first thing I would ask them is, do they specialize in a certain type of real estate? Right. Some people uh, specialize in brand new homes, new home buyers, first time buyers. Some specialize in resales. Mm. Some specialize in different types of mortgages. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I would first find out, well, what is there a particular area that you specialize in or that you're really good at, like better than everybody else? And let's say that thing happens to be refinancing. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, then I would say, okay, who? 
could best benefit from a book that you wrote if they're dealing with refinancing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's an older couple who is looking to, uh, you know, take some money out of their home to uh, finance a vacation or to finance the kids' colleges or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So the, that's the next question I ask is who would be best benefit from this knowledge that you have? Let's figure who right. that person is. And then the next question I would ask is, well, what do you want the book to do for you? Because yeah, it's all well and good to say I want to write a book, but then what are you going to do with it af after that, right? Are you going to use it to get new clients, right? Are you going to be sending it to these people who want to refinance and using that? Are you going to do workshops for people who refinance and you're going to do a workshop and your book is going to be the textbook, if you will, for the workshop? So I would ask, what do you want this book to do for you? Or do you want to go on the speaking circuit? You know, do you want to become the real estate person that's known for refinancing? Right. Mm -hmm. And so you want to go on stage and you want to be paid for speaking to all these various associations or organizations. So that's the next question I ask is, you know, what do you want the book to do for you? And then we, once we answer those questions, then we hone in on what is the biggest problem about refinancing that these people might have, right? Mm, right. Because you can't put everything you know mm. in a book about even that narrow topic because people right. don't want to read that kind of a book. People don't want to read a 300 page book anymore. They want to read a small book that solves a specific problem. So mm. then we hone in on what area of refinancing do you want to target this book is it how to get approved is it what to do with the money you know is it how to fix your house up so that you can get uh, refinanced what area do you really want to focus this book on and that becomes then the start of the rest of the process wow see i knew you was going to be able to handle the question <laughs> Okay, so she over delivered <laughs> on that answer. Thank you so much. Not only did you over deliver, you took like two or three of my other questions and answered those too. Okay, alrighty then. I love it. I, I love it. Over I, I love it. Okay. So, all right. So let's got let's get into this. Mm -hmm. I'm a business owner, right? Mm -hmm. You just completely sold me on, you know the fact that I can write a book and yes. what that topic should be. But I'm yes. still on the fence right now. And mm -hmm. what I want to know is, okay, do I want to take the time? Do I want to take the, the, the money and, and all mm -hmm. it's going to take for me to actually write a book? Do I want to mm -hmm. go through this? What, I may, what I'm thinking may be a daunting experience right. to do all right. of this. And then if I do it, then what? So for right. those folks who don't really necessarily know, Mm -hmm. um, maybe why it's worth it to, mm -hmm. to put that, that time investment and that monetary investment into right. making this happen. Can you let us know why sure. we might want to consider that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right, Mayo. It is an investment both in time and in money to get a book written. Mm -hmm. And you you and, and as business people, we all know we only have a certain number of hours in the day and if we put our time and money against this, are we going to get the return that we're expecting? Mm -hmm. So I am very realistic with my clients and, and I tell them you will probably not get rich off the book sales as your stream of income. Right. Unless you're like, you know, a Tony Robbins, a TD Jakes, you know, or somebody like that. No, right. you're not going to make a million dollars off of book sales because the average nonfiction book sells about 200 to 300 copies over its lifetime, right? It's very different from fiction because you can be, you know, you can write a fiction series and sell thousands and thousands of copies, but for nonfiction, it's that it's a totally different animal. So mm -hmm. then you would say, well, why, why then do I waste my time and go through this if I'm only going to sell 200 to 300 books? Right. Well, the reason is, is that book becomes a leverage point. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll go back to my own example as I talked about the uh, the bed and breakfast book. That mm -hmm. book became the um, it was put into the uh, new innkeeper curriculum 
for several of the state bed and breakfast associations. So mm -hmm. that book was bought in bulk by several different states, right? So that's one mm -hmm. way that you can, you can beef up your book sales. The other thing it did for me is it opened the door to speaking engagements. So mm -hmm. I spoke at several conferences for the state bed and breakfast associations. So mm -hmm. what the book can do for you is provide leverage to your higher price products and services, right? Mm -hmm. I like to tell people, give the book away, right? Because as an author, if you buy your own copies as an author, like say the, the uh, not even the wholesale price, but the author price, it's gonna be probably $5 or less for you to buy that book. Mm. That you, but it has high value to the person that you're giving it to. Right. So if you're trying to get a high value client, and you come to a meeting and you bring your book as opposed to just your business card, they're mm. not going to throw that book away. Even if they don't read it, they're not going to throw it away. It's going to go on their desk, on their credenza, in the bookcase. And at automatically, that's going to put you head and shoulders above the other people who might be doing the same thing that you are. Mm. I also like to use an example of a dog trainer because I have a dog, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's elderly now, but you mm -hmm. know, but, but I, I like to give this example because it's easy for people to understand. Mm -hmm. If I'm interviewing someone who I want to be a dog trainer for my pet, right? Mm -hmm. These two people come with the same experience. They both have great customer reviews on Yelp mm -hmm. and they both are very personable and they seem like they would do a good job. Mm -hmm. One of them has his business card the other one has a book about dog training that he wrote and he leaves that book with me, his process. Mm -hmm. Which one do you think is going to have a higher value in my mind, right? right? So that is the value of the book. Yes, it's an investment and it really is going to depend on what you do with it after the fact as to how successful it's going to be for you. But mm. I firmly believe that it that a book can be a six-figure revenue stream for you mm -hmm. if you leverage it in the proper way. Wow. Now, there's some that might push back and say something like, well, yeah, but it's 2022. You know, people still reading books when they've got you know, audio downloads and so forth and they can get digital books and all that. Would mm -hmm. you still, what would you say to those people that are thinking that maybe? Sure. Books are still being read and written and read. Um, mm -hmm. I, I subscribe to uh, a industry publication called Publishers Weekly mm -hmm. and they give the stats for all books, nonfiction, fiction, all children's books, all kinds of books. The book industry is still very, very successful. There's thousands and thousands of books that are being written. Mm -hmm. and, and go back to what I said about when you bring that book, they may not read it. I'm not saying that everybody who gets your book will read it, but it, you already have the value as soon as you hand it to them because a book is still a high value product. It's still considered, it mm -hmm. puts you in the position of being a teacher, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to a salesperson, right? right? A salesperson has a business card, a teacher has a book. And so right. it automatically, even if they never open it, it automatically right. still gives you that credibility and authority. Right, absolutely. That's phenomenal. I can definitely see that. And actually, I, I these some of these things I know, but I really want them to hear mm -hmm. this, know this, mm -hmm. because this is one of the things that's on my list to do. Yeah, <laughs> actually, right. to be honest. Right. But that actually brings me to another question. Now, there mm -hmm. are other folks who do similar things to what you do that, that help mm -hmm. you write books. What I mm -hmm. want you to share with the audience right now, why should they work with you? What is it about mm -hmm. what you do, your process that's so unique? What's your superpower? Yeah, yeah. Well, I alluded to it earlier. My step-by-step -step process uh, is really what comes into play. I, I have it down to a almost like a formula, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the big problem is that people sit there and they have a blank screen in front of them and they don't know what to write. Mm -hmm. What I do is I help them eliminate that whole blank screen thing because right. we structure it ahead of time. I don't do a chapter. What, what typically they do is a chapter by chapter, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. I don't do that. What I do is have you sit down and do a mind map, right? And a mind map 
just says, okay, what are the 10 things that I want to talk about in this book? Mm. And when you do it that way, you can pick up any one of those 10 things today and start writing about that. You don't have to worry about, is that chapter one or chapter five? Because we do that after you get everything done, then we organize it into chapters. So it makes it much, much easier for the author then to write because the, the knowledge is already in your head, right? You're just right. trying to get it out and get it on paper. So I try to right. make it as easy as possible to do that. And then, um, you know, once we structure it, then we may go back and tweak some things. Um, I, I also like to create chapter templates, right? So <laughs> as an example, um, one of my clients wrote a book and and the templates are all different. They're unique to each client, but um, she wrote a book about finances and we decided that her chapter template was going to be, she would have a quote at the beginning of the chapter. Mm -hmm. She would have an explanation of what her topic for the chapter was. And mm -hmm. then she would have questions for the reader to answer at the end of the chapter. Right. So mm -hmm. that was her template for each chapter. So now now that you know what the template is, you pick up one of those topics to write against and you know, okay, what's the quote for this chapter? What's the meat of this chapter? And what are the questions I'm going to ask at the end? Right. So again, it makes it easier for the author to actually get all of that information out. And that is the value that I bring to the table that other people don't. That's kind of interesting. So would you say that this is a little bit similar to like, say, design thinking? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Goes back to my techie design. Uh. Yeah, I see you. Okay. Yeah, I started. That's why that's what I was exactly what I was thinking. Okay. Interesting. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. Actually, I personally like that. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to come in for a landing now. The time is going mm -hmm. very fast. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is for folks. Um, and we have to do this on every show, which is can you give us your top three, top three things that for people that are trying to make the decision to write a book, what is something they can do tomorrow? What's three things they can do to get started on, I want to say get started on getting started on this project. Yes, right, <laughs> right, right, right. Sure. Well, the first thing I would say is inventory your skills, right? What is it that you know more than anybody? Now, you may not know everything about this topic because you're going to do some research as part of writing the book, but what is it that either you know a lot about or you're passionate about? You may not know as much about, but you're passionate about it enough that you would want to spend the time to share that knowledge with someone else. So that was the first thing I would do. Once you do that, I would then simply go on to Amazon. Amazon is the biggest bookstore in the world. Go on to Amazon and do a search on your topic, right? Mm -hmm. And look at the books that come up in the bestseller ranking for your topic. Mm -hmm. Then I want you to look at those books. Just open some of them. You can even look inside. They have a look inside feature. You can see the table of contents. Mm -hmm. But I would say look at those listings and go down to the reviews mm. and look at the four review, the four star reviews, and look at the two star reviews. Because the two star reviews are people who didn't just trash the book because those would give you one star, but they didn't like it. And there were problems they found problems with the four star review. They liked it, but there was something missing. Right. Mm. Those are like gold because mm. that can then help you see what is missing in the market that I can fill a gap. Right. I can look at somebody that says, oh, this was great information, but it was too technical. Now you can write a book that is same information, but not as technical. Maybe it's from a more approachable standpoint. So those reviews are good because people are basically telling you what they want from mm. a book. And right. you just have to listen to that and then write the book that they want to read. Okay. My drop. <laughs> okay. Wait, <laughs> wait, wait. I, I'm going to add four for her. This is four. Yeah. Call Linda. <laughs> After you do all that, y'all need to go ahead and contact Linda. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because that was so good. I, I need to help. Sometimes I have to help my audience out a little bit. Yes. That yes. was so good that that's just more reason why you don't want to do this by yourself. Right, right, <laughs> Cause, right. Because if you, she just gave you that mm -hmm. as, as just your takeaways. Mm-hmm. 
you need to contact her for the rest. Trust <laughs> me, you, you, you're missing yeah. a lot, lot more. That just kind of, I'm trying to help them out, Linda. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right, that's, that's right. Absolutely okay. correct. <laughs> All right. With that said, we are actually done. But before we go, mm -hmm. Linda, please give them your contact information. How can they get in contact with you? Absolutely. Well, they can reach me uh, via email. My email is Linda at expert author 411, the number 411.com. And I also actually have a little gift for them. Uh, I this The first three steps that we talked about, mm -hmm. I have a workbook that goes into those steps and they can awesome. get that at my website, expert author 411.com forward mm -hmm. slash gift, G-I-F-T. Linda is so bad. I, she probably thought I forgot, but she, she covered my stuff too. I was actually going to ask her. I was like, yeah, okay. Let, folks, I'm not trying to hijack. I'm not trying to hijack your show, man. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm in, trust me, I'm in love with this. <laughs> well, folks, there you have it. Linda Griffin, she is, she's everything that I said she was and then some. You absolutely, folks, if you're going to embark on this journey, like I always tell you guys, get some help. I try to put the best people on this show to help you do it. And they always give you guys great gems, but I'm telling you right now, get the help, get become successful, utilize her time, her experience, leverage what she knows, make the investment guys so that you can actually hit these goals and do what it is that you're trying to do with your businesses. Until next time, folks, take care. God bless. Linda, thank you so much for joining us. It was my pleasure, Mayo. Thank you. Thank you. And we will see you in the next episode. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.